Love looks like you're a peacemaker in your home. Remember today I said you don't, you don't live at the expense of anyone. You don't cop an attitude in your home that puts pressure on the other people in your home. Like you don't just storm off to your room and refuse to respond because you're frustrated. You got to get a grip on yourself and say, wait a minute, what am I accomplishing? I'm actually teaching myself. I'm, I'm causing everybody to submit to my attitude right now. Watch this. Even if your family was wrong, where do you get the capacity to function outside of Jesus? Are you following me? Christians, we have to understand this. We're not, we're not letting sin against us decide our response. We're letting Jesus decide our response. So we're making peace. We're walking in love. Animosity. You have to settle in your heart. Animosity isn't a part of my life. If you're a spouse, I don't care. Honestly, I don't mean I don't care that I don't care. It doesn't matter. That's a better phrase so you don't misunderstand my I don't care. It doesn't matter if your spouse is contentious. You don't ever have to be. These are simple, practical examples right in the home. You, you have to recognize that if your spouse really knew Jesus, really knew Jesus, was walking with Jesus, your spouse wouldn't be that way. That should break your heart, not frustrate your heart. Because your spouse is living in deficit every day. Don't fuel that fire. Put it out. Wow. And don't become a product of that deficit. And don't let the weakness become weakness in you. You can live fulfilled. I found this in my Bible. Oh my goodness, I read this book. It's so amazing. <laughs> Ephesians 3. It says this. It says to know, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge is to be filled with all the fullness of God. Isn't that what we've all searched for? Isn't that what we've wanted, whether we've known it or not? Fullness, completeness in our life? We've been living from deficit. We've been driven. We've been in survival mode. We've been trying to make it. We, hanging in there. How you doing, brother? Hanging in there. What is that? Stop hanging in there. <laughs> hanging in there? I hope on his sandal strap at least. <laughs> and don't let go. It could be a long drop. Hanging in there. No, no. To know the love of Christ, it passes knowledge, is to be filled with all the fullness of God. So I look at the word fullness and it means a house with no empty rooms. It means a town with no empty houses. That's a bigger picture. It means a ship so full of cargo that there's no place to put another box. Fullness. That means you're a house with no empty rooms. There's no vacancy in you. You're fully and completely occupied in knowing his love. Not the treatment of your family members. Knowing his love. Knowing his love decides how you respond in a family. You overcome evil with good. You never repay evil for evil. So practical examples. People treat you unjust at work, at home. People treat you unfair. You never react to unfair. You, sometimes you take it on the cheek. Sometimes you turn the other cheek. That doesn't enable. We think we're enabling people. No, sometimes people actually know what they did. Sometimes they see you didn't react. Convicts them amazingly. Sometimes people are frustrated and they feed off of you being frustrated. It's just amazing how people have lived. It's a psychological warpath sometimes out there. Some people bring their family stuff into work and they're mean and they're mad and they'd love it if you were mad because they're mad. <laughs> and if you don't get mad, they get madder for a while. Yeah. But after a while, they're fascinated by how you don't change. So I'm at work. My boss says I get saved. So I work 13 years as just one of the guys. So I pilferaged. I worked in a food warehouse. There was times I ate things, broke open things, saw things broke open and ate it. When the lights went out, it's not a joke. When lights, when we had power, outage, power outages, me and two guys would run to the crab meat section. We knew how to get there in the dark. We would run to the crab meat section when I wasn't saved. And man, we would bust open crab meat. And, and when the lights would come on, the place smelled like crab meat. And you smelled like crab meat. <laughs> but because they didn't see you eating it, you can't even get crab off you. But man, we got it in us. We <laughs> cans of crab, cans, just globs of crab meat stuffing like pigs in the dark. 
It's amazing what happens in the dark. <laughs> so when I got saved, I did this general assessment. I don't know how accurate it was, but I tried to make it a little above, and I actually felt like I robbed the company and stole about $700 worth of food from the company over the years, 13 years, just breaking open cases. So I went to my supervision, the head guy in the plant, and I apologized and repented and confessed that I had done these things for 13 years, that Jesus changed my life, and, but I need to make this confession. I can't live in this secret. And I had a check written, personal check, to the company for that amount to reimburse them for what I had stolen. And if he felt like it was right through my confession to terminate me, that would be his call. But I assured him I was a different man and I would do my work unto the Lord, but I want to make peace and do this right. That was practical. I made a wrong thing right in the sight of men. I took responsibility for something I was doing, saying, it's not me anymore, and I'm so sorry. It's the only way I know to make it right. And you can look me in the eyes, I'll show you it'll never happen again. He so respected that, it freaked him out. He was like, you're confessing this? You want to pay me a check for I said, absolutely, it's my conscience before the Lord. I'd be honored if you take it. He said, there's no way I'm taking it. I'm excited that you've changed. And I went, oh, okay. <laughs> so, so I started, you know, there's union. It's, yeah. There's precarious things. It's seniority. It's, hey, you don't have to do this job. Bump it down. Hey, you don't have it. So the bottom guy gets all the, the junk. And I started realizing that. And I'm thinking, the poor bottom guy. Like the bottom guy, he might have, he might have got hired two weeks later than you. And he's getting the worst job because he's two weeks later than you. And union is so like big on that stuff, the, the employees. And so I'm union now, and, and the bosses started to read me as a yes man. And they would be like, well, Dan will just do anything we say. He's a yes man. He's a pushover now. We'll just give him all the garbage. It's easy. Nobody will fight us. Nobody will have to yell at us. We'll just give him all the junk. So they'd call me up, and I had a pretty good seniority, and they'd call me. I had 13 years under my belt. They'd call me up and say, here, I got a load for you here. I got a backhoe for you here. And he'd give me some real super undesirable across the board to the workers job. And I'd look, and I'd say, thank you, boss. Well, I appreciate it, and I was glad to have a job. I went and tore that thing up, bang, boom, did it under God. I'd go back up and get another one. My coworkers started to get mad at me. So I got the bosses playing me because I'm a yes man. Now the coworkers are mad because I won't bump it down. And they're saying I'm going to threaten them and they're going to have to do what I'm doing and they're going to have to, and I'm going to end up changing the union laws. Are you kidding me? You can bump it down if you want. Stop. You guys are reacting, right? So I didn't snap on them. I just said, guys, you're so reacting. What are you threatened by? I want to do the job. What do you mean you want to do the job? That's a piece of garbage. You don't want to do that job. Bump it down to Johnny. So Johnny should always have to do the garbage because he's in that position? Johnny doesn't have to come to work and do this every day. Come on, I'll do it. I'm glad they're giving me this job. I can do it. And I explained Jesus to him. Look, he never did anything wrong and he hung on the cross for me. I can do this load for Johnny. And there wasn't a guy in there, even if he didn't agree, that couldn't understand and hear what I was saying. So you know what happened in a couple weeks? Because see, you could, just, you could just go with the flow and make it easy. Okay, I'll just bump it down. Hey, I'm just here. I just want peace. I want you guys off my back. The bosses are using me. They think I'm a yes man, so they're giving me the garbage every day. You could think that if you want, and then go and sing hallelujah and raise two hands. I'm not going to live that way. <laughs> I'm going to take the thing, be thankful, do it unto the Lord, spare Johnny, and tell my coworkers to chill. You know what happened in the course of two years? Probably more than I realize or could number of my coworkers got born again. A supervisor shortly after this whole scenario called my home on my day off and asked if he could talk to me in a mealy mouth voice and tentative. And I said, man, you called. It's okay. Talk to me. What's going on? He said, I don't understand how you live the way you do. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I just, well, it's just the way you live. He said, if I was in your shoes, I'd be frustrated. I'd be mad. I can tell the bosses are using you. They think you're a yes man. And then your coworkers are mad at you for doing what they ask. And you're in the middle and you never change. And he's frustrated on the phone. <laughs> and he said, I know you're going to tell me it's Jesus, but I don't understand. I said, oh, I can explain. You got a minute? And he said, yeah. And I begin to talk. And the next thing you know, he just drives over to my home, sits on my porch, cries, and gets born again. <laughs> Why? Because I took the load. 
It's just simple. And because the next day I took the load, and I took the next one, and the next one. And because my attitude was different, it wasn't as hard as you think. Before I was saved, that load, I would have thought it was going to kill me. I would have dreaded the load. It would have seemed like it was going to take me three hours to do it. I'm saved. I knock it out in an hour and a half and feel great. Give me the next one. That's roll, man. Your whole perspective's changed in love. Because it's never, ever about you. It's about others. And most of all, his great name. And man, I wish we'd honor that more than anything. When you're a Christian, you're saying, I represent Christ. That isn't your theology. It's your life. Your theology, that's a head nod, a head shake. Theology means nothing to people. If they can't see what you say in your life, they'll never want what you say. Practical at home, it takes two to tango. Settle in your heart, you refuse to argue with your spouse no matter what, no matter how wrong they are, no matter how right you are. Right and wrong is a lie in the world. God didn't come in rightness, he came in righteousness. If God came in rightness, we're wrong. What's the difference, Dan? Righteousness makes wrong things right. Righteousness is a view that makes things guilty, not guilty, gives hope, redemption. Rightness just makes you wrong. Well, you did this. Well, you should have never done that. Well, why'd you do that? Yeah. Rightness leaves you wrong. Righteousness makes you right. Why wouldn't I want to, if he rules his kingdom with righteousness, why wouldn't I want to see all men through that eye? Yeah. If he saved me through righteous judgment, why wouldn't I want to live in righteous judgment? Why wouldn't I want to give somebody the benefit of the doubt and give them a chance to change? Even when I know they're wrong, why wouldn't I just give them a chance to change and trust the goodness that I did in their life would tweak their heart enough to bring them conviction and bring change to their performance? So you know somebody's mishandling something, misconducting something. Why won't you just step into their life and they're needy and you, well, you brought this to yourself. You should have, listen, I know you brought this on yourself. I know you've been living out of order. Listen, you've, you've lacked responsibility for a while, man. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, man. Look, I feel bad enough. No, no, I'm not saying that to make you feel worse. I'm just recognizing that I think you really realize that. I do, man. I need change. I, listen, what you need is right now, we'll just get this off of your shoulders. This is too big of a burden to bear. You bear one another's burdens, it says, but each man carries his own load. You still have to walk out your life. But I can step in and say, let me help you with that. I'll tell you what, I'm going to pay that off. If you can, just the practical example, I'm going to pay that off. You say, I ain't paying that off. They live so out of order. Yeah, and I'm hoping they know that now. And the fact that I'm going to pay it off is the same as Jesus coming to my life and paying me off. Yeah, wow. You get what I'm saying? And you say, listen, I'm going to just bless you. I'm going to pay that off. And I won't be a voice in your life if you let me in. And et cetera, et cetera. And, and you do something like that for them before they've proved any change. <coughs> See, sometimes that's the very key that brings change. Because when they were untrustable, you trusted in the sense that they could produce different. When, now I'm not talking about putting your trust in them in the way that they could break your heart. We already covered that. What I'm saying is you're just believing this one little gesture could touch them in such a way of goodness it could bring change in their life and lead to repentance. And if it doesn't, isn't it good to help? Because yeah. if they don't do right, then you have to talk to them about it and say, listen, obviously just paying off your bill is not the answer. We really need help. Guys, you need to sit down. We really need a plan. You need a budget. You need some control, self-control in your life, and you probably need somebody to, don't feel like children in this. You've kind of earned this. You need somebody to help oversee your decisions. Before I even do that, I'll just help them. And trust help itself will bring change. I don't know, how many know my, my buddy Todd White, that knows that Todd White's my buddy and that we have history and roots and stuff. When he went to Teen Challenge, the day he went to Teen Challenge, his girlfriend at the time, Jackie, got a share of sale on their property. And she called me livid, furious. She said she didn't believe in God or anything. And she's livid. And she's like, what am I supposed to do with this? You know, you, you encouraged him to go to this program, and I know you're trying to help him, but he's up here in Teen Challenge now. Here he is at a resort 
eating three meals a day, sleeping and praying, cut me a break. I'm carrying the weight of this family and I got a share of sale and he's robbed us of everything we have and now I'm going to lose the family inheritance and we're going to lose this property. She's furious. And I said, listen, I'm sorry. Everything you're saying's happened and I realize he's made terrible, horrible decisions. Jackie, honey, you got to hold on to something. You got to hold on to the fact that people can change and God's into the changing people business. And I just kind of encouraged her that people can change and I hit her a long time back before, a week or two before, that you're still in this relationship and I know why. Because you have a baby together and somewhere deep down in your heart, you're hoping this can work and be different. And she just cried her eyes out. So I knew what she was sitting on. So I had an ace in the hole. <laughs> so it dawned on me while I'm on the phone. Oh my goodness. I said, well, how much do you owe if you're losing your property? So you must be way behind. She said, no. She said, we're only two months behind. She said, we've been behind so many times that they've cut off the, the slack. They're not cutting us a break anymore. And they said, if we ever get past one month, if it goes into the second month, they're sheriff selling it and they're done working with us because we've been in this thing so much. Because they've left it get months behind and a family member comes up with the money and then Todd stays high and they're broke again and then they're finally nobody wants to help. You get it? So I showed up at their house and I had an envelope and I had a check made out in the amount. She told me what their monthly mortgage was. I said, so you only owe that twice? She said, that's it, but I don't have it. He stole it all and I don't have it. And she's bawling. And I said, honey, I just want to come over and pray with you and sit with you and talk about it for a couple of days. She said, well, okay. So I show up at her house and I, had, I said, hey, I'm glad you let me come over. I said, first, I want to give you this. I didn't know how to make it out too, but just, and she opened it up. And she said, well, what is this? I said, well, it's what you owe. I just don't know who to make it to. My wife and I agreed. I talked to her and she was excited about helping. She was excited. Yeah, I asked her. I told her what I had in my heart. And she was like, oh my goodness, do it. She said, wait a minute, what? And I said, yeah, we want to pay it off. We want to save your property for you. And, and I just believe good things are ahead of you guys. And she started crying and she copped her head. She said, but why would you do this? You got to understand she calls me angry. She's frustrated, but she doesn't understand. You don't judge her for her attitude. She doesn't understand. She knows nothing but hardship, pain, and life. I say I know Jesus. I probably ought to do better than talk about him. I probably ought to manifest him. And when she's yelling me at the phone, I probably shouldn't take it personal and feel slighted. Well, here I am trying to help him and she don't appreciate it. And if she don't appreciate it, well, I don't appreciate her. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. Come on, I'm just being real. The whole time I got to understand, forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. She's not being willful. She's not being malicious. She's not being evil. She's overwhelmed and it's all she knows. But when you show up with that envelope, it's amazing what that stuff does. She said, she's trembling. But why, but why would you do this? Why would you do something like this? I said, because it's what Jesus does. It's Jesus, honey. He loves you. She said, how do I know him? How do I get to know him like you? I said, it's pretty easy. Can we pray? <laughs> She started coming to church, got to praying and seeking the Lord. That Before Todd left Teen Challenge, the Lord said, Todd's coming home. Don't be afraid. I've changed him. She heard it in prayer. She's eight weeks old in the Lord. She heard it in prayer. She's like, Todd's coming home. You're not supposed to leave Teen Challenge in two months. It's a year-long program. He gets a vision, a, a dream, three nights in a row. Happened to be the same dream his grandfather got when his grandfather was 20, couple years old as an alcoholic. The same exact dream. And when his family was thinking he's now, he's one extreme to the other. He's, he's the devil in the flesh and now he's Christian cuckoo. <laughs> and they're like, why can't you just find something in the middle? That makes us all happy. Why are you Mr. Extreme? Either destroying everybody's life or trying to save everybody's life. Why? Why can't you just camp in the middle and be in the middle? Because there is no middle. You're either for him or against him. You either gather or you scatter. There's no middle. 
is black or white. You get gray, it's because you mix the two colors. There's no fence. You sit on the fence, it belongs to the devil. It's compromised. Todd's over Thanksgiving, he's crying out his heart, and they don't even want to talk to him. They're like, you are a Christian kook. And he says, no, you don't understand. I had a dream. And his grandma said, what do you mean? Now him and his grandma and his aunt are sitting there crying their eyes out because they know it was Papa's dream. Wow. It's the exact dream. And you know what grandma said when she heard the dream? Because see, she's just reacting to what she doesn't understand. You better be big enough in love to understand that people are reactionary when they don't understand. Yeah. Don't take it personal. Be more secure. Be more complete in Christ than people's reactions. Don't get excited about something because the three people you love the most aren't that excited. Don't lose your excitement. Wow. Don't run to them to get them to participate. And if they don't, you're crushed. Are you kidding me? You have a greater revelation than that, I hope. Yeah. Wow. Just simple stuff. But they, they heard the vision and then they, they bawled and cried and said, you had the same dream as Papa. That's amazing. And he said, what? And she told and he cried and cried and cried. And you know what Grandma said? A minute ago, she thinks he's a Christian cuckoo. Guess what Grandma said? You know what I think, Todd? I think Papa never fulfilled what God called him to. He just stopped drinking through the dream, but he never went on and did what God had for him. I think that all came upon you. And from then on, Grandma began to pray for Todd and appreciate his salvation. Practical. Todd, I watched him so many times. He was just barely saved. I saw his father-in-law come up to him and say, you ain't fooling me with all this Jesus stuff. You're a loser and you're always going to be. Hiding behind all these Christian words. I'm standing right there. He's like, well, Dad, don't call me Dad. Oh, you, I was right there standing. Well, come on, you are my dad, stop. I, I, I just did these things, and I realize it, and I'm sorry. I know you can't receive that, but you'll see. Time will tell. You'll see. I love you. Don't say you love me. Less than a year later at a family gathering, he interrupts when they ask Todd to pray because he's the Christian. Pray over the food. Well, you're the one going to church now out of all of us. How about you praying for the food? Isn't that funny? And when Todd's ready to pray, father-in-law steps up and says, wait, Todd, don't pray. And Jackie's like, oh, no, what's Dad going to do? He starts bawling and crying and says, can you forgive a fool a year ago? I said, you'll never change, and I was wrong. You're an amazing man, and I honor you, and I'm sorry I was wrong. Come on, Todd could have took exception. Todd, Todd could have got insecure. He could have tried to prove him wrong. Worse yet, he could have had some kind of spite in his heart and ha-ha, I told you so. And he just wept and they held each other and Jackie said it was a blubbering mess. They just cried like babies and she was crying. <laughs> Simple, practical. You can't take life personal. There's no selfishness in love and there's no love in selfishness. You can't complain. You, you, you can't mix complaining and love. Complaining means you're not satisfied, you're not happy. Doesn't mean you have to agree with everything, but you know what I mean by complaining? To where it affects your attitude. To where you start feeling sorry for yourself or angry about unfairness or, well, this ain't right or, well, I shouldn't have to, or why do they gotta? Love never does that, guys. The Bible says when you complain, you set yourself up to be destroyed by the destroyer, devoured by the one that devours. 1 Corinthians 10. Oh, it's there. Complaining is a dead giveaway that you're still about you and things don't suit you. That would be like Jesus sitting on the Mount of Olives on a rock saying, I just don't think people like me, Lord. I mean, I try to do right. I heal people. How much more do I got to do? I mean, I raised Lazarus from the dead and now they want to kill him again at me. I just don't think they love us, God. I'm not sure why we care so much about him. It sure don't seem like they care about us. I mean, I do good and they talk bad about me. I mean, you shouldn't even let me hear their thoughts. Their thoughts are not pleasant. <laughs> Come on, would you be secure enough to hear every man's thoughts? Wow. See, you ought to look at that. Jesus perceived their thoughts and it didn't change him. 
There was a time the Lord was showing me a vision about some things very personal, a couple visions. He said, do you know why I'm showing you these things? I said, so I can pray. He said, I'm showing you because I can. He said, because you'll never respond like a man. You'll respond like me. And that's where he taught me that he can tell himself anything. And if I become one with his heart, I'm in. There's things God can't even show us because we'll react to it instead of respond in him. He's a good God. He's loving. He's amazing. He's solid. Yeah? Wouldn't it be amazing to walk in the heart of God to where you're just in and he can show you things freely? I've been in situations where I knew who touched the young girl. I even knew their name. I knew how old they were and didn't even know the young girl in public so that God could rescue them from the lie that was paralyzing their life. He's not going to give you that insight if you're going to see her wrong or see her different. He's going to give you that insight because you're going to love her and weep over her and hold her when she falls on you just like he would. And right there, he's going to deliver her. Not in four months after 12 more sessions. (laughs) Forgive me. I'm sorry. But right there, he's going to deliver her. Yeah? Yeah. Why would he show you that stuff? Because he can. (laughs) So our goal is become in love. So you're a peacemaker. You tone down a harsh word with a kind word. Sometimes you're wise enough to say nothing. There was a time my wife was not happy with me when I first got saved because we were blown apart and I lived like the devil. And all of a sudden, I'm a Christian, surrendered, praying in my room. She did not handle that very well. You think she'd have been happy? No, she already took a redirection in her life and she cut me off and figured this is over and she ain't backtracking. And all of a sudden, I come and tell her I'm saved and she thinks it's a slap in the face. She thinks, 13 years I prayed for you to get saved. We finally call it quits, and I muster up the, to say, yeah, and harden myself enough to walk out of this thing, and now you want to come and pull this, and you're finally saved after all these years? Too late, pal. Even if you are, forget it. Well, I didn't get saved for her to come back. I was celebrating we weren't together. I was a very presumptuous, proud fella. I, I wasn't sorrowing my marriage falling apart. I was celebrating that. It was bad. I celebrated it to her face. It was bad. Told her I wasted 13 years of my life with her. That's pretty bad. Brutal. And now I'm born again and realize how much I value her and that she did nothing wrong, went the extra, extra mile, and was more of a Christian than I ever realized and was a peacemaker. And that I spewed on her for 13 years and it broke my heart. And I realized for the first time in my life I loved her because love came inside of me. Now I'm safe. So I come out of my bedroom. She's standing there like this. You make me so sick. You live like the devil for 13 years, and now you're some holy man of God. I don't think so. That's where you go like this. (laughs) You know what you could say? I guess you could say, well, Kim, you know God forgives and God changes you got to really be careful of a hard heart or a root of bitterness if you would continue to pray. See, you're even mad at God. If you just continue to pray and seek the Lord, you'd be able to see that God really is changing my life. But instead, you're sitting back in your pain and your hurt and seeing me for everything I did for you and you're missing who I'm becoming. And, and everything I said could have actually been right. <coughs> but oh, it would have been wrong. <laughs> I'd have probably lost my eyeballs. <laughs> I'd be preaching to you today like this. <laughs> Unless God really moved. <laughs> so yeah. you got sometimes love just does this. Because you perceive where the heart is and it's not time to speak. And you want to make sure. You know how we've always tried to win a conversation or get the last word or do that little jab? There's just a little statement that has a little point to it. That's a good sign that you're very alive and you need to die. <laughs> <laughs> so because you're trying to win. You're upstaging somebody. You're trying to win. You're speaking down on them. It's nothing like Jesus. Sometimes you need to just know when to... Yeah? So there's all kinds of discernment we need. But here's here's the simple thing about this long-answered question. (laughs) When 
when you're seeking God to become more like Him and you're putting off the things that you know are self-centered and you're putting on the things that you know are God, a lot of these things unfold in the moment. They're in the happening. There's no real textbook on them. We're not a bunch of robots. It's not do this, do this, do this, do this. It's become this, and this will take definition. Are you with me? And you'll discern in the moment. People are individuals. People are in all different levels. You can't sit down and listen to somebody and how they handled and responded in their marriage and try to do what they did because your marriage could be in a whole different place and your spouse could be in a whole different place their spouse was. Yeah? So there's no textbook answer other than basic general principles of what love is and what love looks like. But you guard your heart from offense. Love keeps your heart free from offense. You always question the why and what you're saying and doing and make sure it's pure because the pure in heart will see God. Right? And they're the sons of God, right? So you weigh yourself in those things. And that's how you can test if you're really growing in a right and healthy direction. And you just love not your own life unto death. It's not hard. I don't know why we think that's hard. You get alone with God and you start declaring it. Father, I thank you that you never created me for me. You created me for your image and your glory. And man, I've been driving this car, running this ship for a long time. I... Man, I just thank you that it's all yours and no one, no one on this earth owes me a thing. Like I'm going to bed tonight in thankfulness. When I wake up tomorrow, there's one reason that I'm going to rise. If I rise tomorrow, mercy's going to let me rise to just have one more day to be more like you. I want to be like you. I want to shine. I want to walk in love. Holy Spirit, I welcome you. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, for the conviction in my everyday life to respond to people and to address people exactly as you would if you were in my shoes. And since you're in me, you are. So I thank you for loving them through me. That's the way I've talked for years to the Lord. Just wake up in the morning, wow, thank you for another day. Not, oh boy, another day. Come on. We've called that prayer. Six o'clock already? You gotta be kidding me. I hardly slept at all, God. You gotta give me grace. I'll never get through. And if that boss, I'm telling you, God, if you let him talk to me like he talked to me yesterday, I'm gonna quit right on the spot. And then you say, you prayed that morning? I don't think you prayed. (laughs) I think you're in a self-centered cry delusional session. (laughs) And I don't think your voice is in the bowls of incense. (laughs) <laughs> might be in a bowl <laughs> but it's not incense <laughs> Whew, could use some incense <laughs> I'm sorry you guys okay but that's not prayer that's perspective see so twisted and all of a sudden it's just all about you getting through your day and why and the complaints and you call it prayer and god you need to give me grace and then at night you go to your bed oh god thank you and you grab your pillow and hold it because you survived that's a good way to have a hard time getting up yeah. no you sit on the edge of your bed and you're thankful no matter how things unfolded thankful that you know truth and even if somebody judged you wrong saw you wrong or treated you wrong Wow, I'm so glad, God, that I never have to be a product of how men treat me anymore. I'm a product of what you've done and who you are in me. This is amazing to live free. Thank you that no one owes me a thing on this earth and I owe no man anything but to love. And love fulfills the law. It does no harm to a neighbor. Man, I'm having a blast. Thanks for living inside of me. Why is that hard? It's so not hard. And then you wake up in the morning and you're married and you have children. Wow, Father, thank you that today I can be a light and an example. I ask for wisdom in every situation. And I just thank you. In my case, I'm a guy, so it's a wife. And, and, and if you're a girl, it's a husband. But I just thank you that my spouse, that's just you, spouse. I thank you that my spouse owes me absolutely nothing today. I'm privileged to shine and love and to serve and even help and power to bring out the best in her life. And, and God, I appreciate you for the wisdom to do so. And even if we don't agree today on something, I thank you. I can value her, value even her opinion to the extent that I always love her and value the person she's created to be. Thank you for these eyes you've put inside of me. See, I don't know if you know this, but you're talking to a guy, see, and I'm talking from a place where for eight years my wife believed one strong lie and it threw her into identity crisis. I'm full-time pastor. She won't even come to church. 
She won't even answer the telephone when people call to try to help her and says they're only calling because I'm so messed up. Spewed on me countless times, accused me of things that were totally outside the box and was lost in the lie of her own value in life and said, people don't love me, they love you. I'm just your wife. The only reason they say hi to me is because I'm with you. If I wasn't with you, no one would know I was in the room. That's a good way to trash yourself. So my wife lived that way for eight years. Lost her desire to receive love, lost her desire, the intimacy thing. Hello? I know fellas out there, two days is a stretch, three days is we got to talk. I am not on the earth for her to love me. I'm on the earth to be like Jesus. So wouldn't you say in these eight years that my wife is in trouble? Would you say she's in trouble? Would you say she really needs a revelation of Jesus and his love? Well, guess where he lives? Right inside of me and I live in her home. So now's probably not the time to be a frustrated husband. Calling for counsel and saying, how long is this going to last? And how long can I bear this weight? And if she doesn't change soon, I don't know what I'm supposed to do because I can't live like this anymore. Well, if God said that about your life when you weren't living in him, you'd be in big trouble. There's a good practical example of love. Eight years. You say eight years? Don't make eight years the point. Truth doesn't know time. Are you telling me this could go on for eight years? I ain't telling you anything. I'm telling you truth is truth. Hook up to truth. Watch this. Whether it's eight years or it never changes. (gasps) Don't talk like that. No, I'm going to talk like that, especially because you're afraid of me talking like that. That means you've got to grow in something. <laughs> Whether it's eight years, two months, or it never changes, it doesn't change truth, so why would you change? You might not know this, but at the very same time, my two children made terrible decisions, and for some reason, this eight-year thing happened to all three of them. All together, I'm in a family of four. That's three. So if you're not secure and you don't understand things, where did I fail? I can't even steward my family. How can I steward the church? And you don't understand that everybody needs their own revelation of God and they're all living in a moment of weakness and they're all believing their own respective lies. It's not because I was a hypocrite. It's not because I was going to church preaching one thing and living something else at home because they're only all struggling within their own self in a demonic war over truth. So guess what I should do? Stand in truth. So if my own kids won't let me hug them, I'll just hug yours. Yours are just as important. They cost the same. (laughs) It's amazing. You can't even preach this stuff in church. We're so sentimental. We actually believe our own children are more valuable than other people's children. They are all cost the same. They all cost the blood of Jesus. They all have eternal life and eternal destiny. The only difference is they have an inheritance within your bloodline and your family, but they're no more valuable. Your kids are no more valuable than your neighbor's kids. Wow. You're just bias. God's love. Wow. He taught me this stuff a long time ago. I could hug your kids like they're my own, I promise. I could hug you like you're my own family. Why? I know your value. He shed his blood to redeem your life. And whether you know who you are or not, I know who you are. That's why people don't bother me and get under my skin. I got new skin. I talk to people in public and I tell them I love them. They say, you can't say you love me. You don't even know me. You just met me. You don't even know my name. I don't have to know your name to love you. I know why you're here. I know you're the will of God. There's a time to be born and here you are. You're created. You have a purpose, a destiny, and Jesus shed his blood for you. You are the plan of God. The fact that you're standing in front of me is the yes of God right there. And you're worth his blood, and he wants his life in you. So, yeah, I love you. (laughs) Freaks people out. They think I have to know them for six months and get to know them, decide if I even like them before I can say I love them. (laughs) 
I can love you on sight. <laughs> Just telling you. Because of the truth that I understand. That's why people don't frustrate me. It's practical. It's love. You lay down your life for people. Take the back seat. Give. Show mercy. Make peace. Practical. I fly on airplanes. If, if, if there's an oversail and... There's times I need to get home and I want to get home or I've been on a long trip and there's times where I have a cake flight and it's an easy flight and there's an oversell and somebody's crying because they can't get on the plane. They're going to get my seat. What? They're going to get my seat. They're overwhelmed. They don't fly much. I fly all the time, so I have to wait three hours to get on the next plane. I'm going to get them home because they don't know how to handle the dilemma. They're in their young lady. They think they're going to spend the night in Chicago or Detroit. They're overwhelmed. I probably ought to give them my seat. That's the stuff I do. It's practical. You ask. And the gate agent's like, why would you give them your seat? Like, you have a confirmed seat. Nobody gives their seat. I said, yeah, that's probably a problem, isn't it, ma'am? It's like nobody gives, gives their life, but one gave his life for me. Here's the raw truth. I say it all the time to you. Here's the raw truth, honey. Somebody took my seat a long time ago and gave me theirs. To give them my seat on this plane is a small thing. His name is Jesus, honey. He changed my life. That's, I had one gate agent start crying. She said, that's the most beautiful thing I ever heard. <laughs> she called me to the gate and wanted to know if she could switch out my seat. And I had 10A, and it's at the bulkhead of first class. It's a living room. You can. <laughs> That's 10A right there. I fly. Right there is 10A, buddy. You're looking at it. California to the East Coast. You can think 10A, that was a gift from the Lord. Get behind me, Satan. You, you can think the gate agent's the devil. And spiritualize it. Yeah. Trying to take my blessing. You ain't cutting into my blessing. No, get behind me, girl. I'm sitting in 10A. <laughs> ain't nobody taking what the Lord gave. <laughs> you better be careful how you preach. <laughs> she said, she said, sir, I really, are you flying alone? I said, yes, ma'am. Here's what you don't know. On the way out there, I gave my seat. You know what's cool? I don't pick my seats because then I don't have to give my seat. I just let the computer sit me, and I fly all the time. I have status. <laughs> I could enter on the red carpet. I usually go through the pagan line. <laughs> it's just hilarious what we do. Red carpet. And she shuts that lane and opens the other lane. General boarding. Pagans, commoners, <laughs> low life, no life, <laughs> get in line, because everybody that matters is already on the plane, with the best seats. <laughs> I'll sit by the pooper if the computer puts me there. You know why? Because somebody has to. I'll sit in the middle if the computer puts me there. You know why? Somebody has to. Why can it never be you? Wow. Preferred customer. When the gospel says lay down your life. So on the way out, you, you might not even believe this. This is too crazy of a story. Practical. Long answer. <laughs> you turn the corner. You got 10A. On the way out, you got 10A. It's for real. You're like, God, that's 10A. Oh. <laughs> it's a living room. 10A. <laughs> Remember that if you fly. No, no. Give it to somebody else. <laughs> so it's not wrong to have 10A. I was happy. 10A. I turned the corner. There's a man from India sitting in my seat. I knew he was a straight up full-blooded man from India because the lady beside him had her little red thingy and the lady beside her had her little red thingy and they were dressed colorful and I thought, whoa, these folks are straight from India. And I said, well, hey, sir. And I looked, I did what everybody does. I looked at my ticket and I thought, I know this is 10A. There's a guy in my seat. It was like the three bears. <laughs> Somebody's in my bed. 
<laughs> and he spoke a little broken English. He said, oh, oh you, this your seat? And I said, y yes, sir, 10A? Y yes, yes, I was, hoping, I was hoping you would let me sit here with my family and you would switch with me and take my seat. I said, stay with your family, that's a no-brainer, buddy. I said, I'll take your seat, where, where are you at? He said, 30E. I said, what, 30E? <laughs> Do you realize E's the middle? See, you don't fly much. It's a six-seater, A, B, C, D, E, F. B, E, middle. 30E. I said, you got it, buddy. Enjoy the flight. I'm glad you can all stay together. Didn't even blink. I know 30 E's the middle. I know it's way back there by the pooper. <laughs> but I took my little stick in my little bag and I took <laughs> I headed back there to 30 E. Now, you don't understand this, but when I get back there, I'm not being rude. There's two ladies in the aisle and the window, and they're much larger than the seat. I'm not being rude. They're very large ladies. There's no way you're putting down the armrests. No way. And I looked, and there's my seat. And I said, hey, girls. <laughs> I have so much fun, man. I'm like, hey, girls. I'm in there, and they're, they're nervous. They already know. They know they're heavy. Oh, you hurt. They know that somehow the computer put them both in the same row. It's like a nightmare. They're like, oh my goodness, who's going to sit here? <laughs> the little skinny guy from India? He would have fit. <laughs> He's in my living room. He's back in my house. And I'm taking his house. And I just had fun with it. I said, well, girls, I'm, I, that's my seat. I said, they said, okay. I said, we, looks like we're going to be close and intimate on this ride. We're going to get to know each other, girls. And I was laughing, just having a lighthearted time. And they're like, oh, oh. I turned. <laughs> turn, I just, <laughs> I just, I know. Oh, I was warm the whole way. I didn't even put down the, the I just propped on the ladies. I said, I hope you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> I just have fun. And next thing you know, you talk about Jesus. Next thing you know, you pray with one of them. It's just all right. I was warming. And I was locked in. I didn't even need my seatbelt on that one. I was, just, I was just in. So now we're leaving. I get called to the gate. I got 10A on the way home. I'm like, Lord, are you serious? You put me back in 10A? Because I don't pick my seat. You put me in 10A? Oh, my goodness. I gave 10A. You put me in 10A. That's sweet. Dan Muller, come to the desk. Are you traveling alone, sir? I am. She rolls her eyes. Sir, I, I have a favor to ask. I said, do you want to keep a family together? Do you need my seat? She said, well, yes. That's what I was going to ask. I said, honey, if you're keeping a family together, it's a no-brainer. I said, sure, I'll give my seat. She said, well, you didn't even ask what seat I have for you. I said, does it matter? Totally absurd thought to a gate agent. Does the seat I'm in matter? She's like, that's the highest blasphemy <laughs> in the airport. She goes, well, I would certainly think it matters. And I'm like, yeah, that's because that's what every customer projects. But if I'm keeping a family together and I'm taking a seat, it wouldn't be true giving if it mattered what seat I get in exchange. She said, sir, I've never met anybody with the mindset you have that perspective. And I said, that's probably sad, isn't it? She put her eyes in, well, yeah. I said, isn't it amazing how everyone's for themselves? I said, can I tell you where I got this perspective? She said, yeah, because that's a very rare view. I said, a long time ago, and I pulled her in, I, I, I hook lined and I'm a fisherman anyway. <laughs> I said, a long time ago, there was this man, and I was in a seat that was so undesirable, and there was no way to get out. And he came, and he took me out of my seat and put himself in it, and sat me where he sits. She's like, what? He did? 
his name is Jesus. And she went, oh my, that's the most beautiful thing I ever heard. And she started crying. And I said, yeah, and he changed my life through it. And I'm going to live like he lives and be like he is. I said, give me your hands. I want to pray for you. She gave me her hands. I said, fires out. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. I'm just kidding. I didn't do that. See, you like that. You people like that. You're like, yeah, give me the fire. Ah! <laughs> See, you people. <laughs> they like that. I, I, <laughs> why do you like that so much? So, so I was like praying with her, and she's just weeping and sobbing. And after we were all done, she looked up and smiled and said, you know what? I said, what? She said, I had a window seat for you anyway. I said, oh, bless your heart. And she gave it to me, and she was just so glad I met you. Who knows that one little encounter? Watch. I'm not even thinking ministry. I'm just being me. And that's so evangelistic, it's ridiculous. I'm not even thinking evangelizing. Because when you think evangelizing, you're probably a robot. When you're living Jesus, it probably whacks the human heart. Yeah? Okay. I'm sorry, that was an hour. <laughs> hey, it's a long question, man. <laughs> oh, that was an hour. Wow! Ah! Oh my goodness. Are you kidding? Question and answer, we got through one. But isn't that the question like? I say it everywhere I go, guys. See, I'm still going. Now look. No, listen, seriously, if we miss this, yeah. honestly, if we miss this, yeah. we've missed the whole reason that he came. Yeah. And we did a lot of church yeah. and failed to become her. What a bummer. This is what we're here for. It really doesn't cost you anything because there's such a joy in living this way. If you have the finances, if you have the means, and you're ever in a grocery line and you take notice to somebody and you realize they probably work hard, she might be a single mom, rather than say, well, I wonder why she's single and got them babies. You might want to just take your card when they ring her bill and all them groceries and just reach up and just swipe it like that and just step back. It's so fun. <laughs> Because the clerk gets freaked out. Like, sir, that was her. And the lady's like, sir, you just swiped your card at my bill. <laughs> yeah, I know. Why would you do? Because I wanted to. Because Jesus just spoke to my heart and said, bless her. I want to pay her bill and encourage her. And honestly, honey, I feel like this has been a time where you've been a little pressed and finances have been a little tight. And I think this will really bless you today. And it's my honor to love you in Jesus this way. So just say thank you and just move on in your day and be blessed. He loves you so much. And the clerk? She can't even function. I'm just telling you. It's fun. When you don't think for yourself, life actually gets fun. When you think for yourself, anxiety, worry... Trouble, yeah? When you don't think for yourself, oh my goodness, <laughs> let's just have fun. <laughs> Doesn't cost you anything. Just lay down what you never were created for anyway and pick up what you're here for. The simple little things. True story, you're in a grocery line. 18-year-old little clerk, she's just learning, first job. She's training and she's on her own today because she was training. You're about six back. It's busy. You might be eight back. And she hits a wrong key and she don't know how to get out of that thing. And she's got to call a manager to come and neutralize things and get things back on track so she can keep working. And the grunts and the noises that come out of the row of people are amazing. The looks, the unspoken body language, the inner frustration coming out in the face, 
And there's a little frail 18-year-old girl under pressure, so she has two options. Break and fall apart or harden herself and say, who cares and gives a flip about that? So you're forcing her into being one or the other. So guess what you do when you're a Christian? And maybe seven of those people in line, maybe a couple of them actually go to church. And they're going, oh, well, this is going to be a long run. I don't know we'll ever get home for supper. Huh? She hears all that. She sees it. She hears it. She's under more pressure. She can't think. She's going to hit another button wrong. And then you're going to blame her? So guess what you do? Right in front of the line. True stories. Not analogies. Excuse me, honey. Hey, listen. I don't want you under that much pressure and you make your way past everybody. I realize sometimes we get impatient. We don't even see the value of human beings and people. You're very young. Is this one of your first jobs? You just get past training. You're pretty new. And even somebody that's been older than this might have done something like this. It's, honey, I just want you to know we release you. And I'm sorry that we express frustration and impatience at the cost of your soul, your emotions. No, I value you. You're precious. You're more than a mistake of hitting the wrong button. And I'm sorry that we've made you feel this small and belittled. And I just begin to point, and everybody's there. <laughs> because you're going, your true colors are coming out now if you're in that line. You're either going to get repentant and go, oops, man, I was being a knothead. Or you're going to be like, whatever. I wish they'd get people that know how to run this piece. You're just going to stay hard or you're going to learn from this. But either way, I'm going to give you the chance. And the worst you could probably do is punch me or yell at me. Well, the worst you could do is shoot me and kill me, but I'm not going to die. But <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So you encourage her, and she sniffles, and you say, no, seriously, you need to relax. Your manager's coming anyway, honey. You can do this job, and you'll get better. And I'm sorry that we put even more pressure on you than it's already on your shoulders. I don't want you under pressure. Come on, God's going to give you grace. We're going to pray. Father, I thank you for your love right now for her. And God, I just appreciate And when you're praying, his comfort comes on her. His presence begins to touch her. Yeah? And you're just trusting that he's like backdrafting <laughs> into the line. <laughs> You can have faith for anything, man. <laughs> and then you slide back, and you take your place, and nobody's saying a word, and everybody's weirdly uncomfortable. <laughs> but guess what she is? Encouraged. And that pressure's off. And she's learning not to take that kind of stuff so hard. Yeah? Yeah? That's Christianity. Simple Christianity. Take a stand for what you believe and minister the truth of it in the midst of people, especially when they're living out of context and out of, yeah? And be a light in a dark place. And rescue a girl that's in trouble. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Do <laughs> we got time? <laughs> okay. Um, in your opinion, how should believers engage with the political issues of our day? Abortion, racial tension, immigration, etc. Wow. In my opinion. I don't I don't even that's funny because I don't really talk about politics from the pulpit much at all. Uh, I think love has the same Honestly, this isn't a cop-out, okay? First of all, with politics and stuff, prayer is huge. Prayer is huge. Pray for all men, especially those in authority. I say that you should pray for all men. So make sure, rather than talking about what you disagree with, you're actually praying from a sincere heart for God to intervene in that avenue, and in that arena. It's just too easy to have gripe. It's too easy to have an opinion in politics. My goodness, let's pray. Let's ask God for justice behind the scenes, in the midst, upright hearts, people coming into office that actually fear him and know him, and the people that are in there that don't. That doesn't mean we're ship without water or something. That means God can bring change. 
Would you bring them to truth? God, would you grant them wisdom? And you begin to pray with compassion, understanding maybe even the pressures of certain things and some of the temptations instead of just sitting back like that, you know? And uh, as far as issues with uh, homosexuality and abortion and things, uh, it's a hard one because there's, there's so much defense and walls set up to where people are listening for words and, oh, so you're against, oh, so you're one of these Christians that do, 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 do. I, I don't think it's something that can be addressed in a political forum or a media forum. I think it's something that's addressed in an individual way, in a personal way within your own life as you come in contact with such. Yeah, I really think it's too defended too much public eye, I think the, the world would just lash out at the Christian response. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't be one bit interested in trying to sit on a panel, open public media, and get in, in, in a confrontation, a debate, or a thing with people sitting there unless I would take it into the arena of having the access to really minister, teach who we're created to be, try to unlock some lies, and show that I actually value the people that are living in those arenas. That would be a joy. I don't know that you'd have that capacity because there's such an attack mentality on anything that doesn't agree. So rather than try to go through that avenue, which God is so not limited to that avenue, sometimes that avenue is a setup because it's called public eye. I think the higher avenue is you and I in our everyday life embracing people that we come across, that we find out and that we realize and embracing them. I had some ladies that were in that lifestyle come into a healing service that I did twice a week. They came for weeks. And they were overwhelmed by the love they saw in my heart towards the people and towards them. And, and they kept coming and they kept coming and they were listening, they were hearing things they never heard. And they came for weeks and they literally fell in love with my heart and they valued the Christ that they saw in me. I didn't know that they were in this lifestyle and I didn't know that they had been trying to fit in churches for a long time. And then the churches would realize their lifestyle and, and obviously sit down and have the meeting, you know, this isn't God, and et cetera, et cetera. So one day I'm leaving and they were hanging around and I said, hey girls, glad to see you again. I gave them hugs and they said, can we talk to you? And they looked a little emotional. I said, sure. I said, let me go down and make sure things are squared away in the office and let me let the administrator and the secretary know that I'll be up here and da 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 da. And I just need to cover some things in the office. I'll be right back up. Come back. And they were waiting. And we sat and they shared their lifestyle with me and shared their story and how people have handled them. And they kept saying, you're the most loving man. This was their view. I'm not boasting in me. It was just their view. They were saying, you're the most loving man we've ever met. You are so sincerely loving. We can tell you love people and you value people. And I'm like, well, I do. It's because of Jesus. It's all his fault. Like, he <laughs> He, he did that to me. And, and they said, well, we wanted to know what you think about and what your opinion is on. And they shared their lifestyle. And they told me their story. And I said, wow. And because they valued me, because I knew they respected my voice, I was very open with them. And I just shared from the beginning. And I shared, I actually shared Romans 1 with them. And I shared some scripture with them. And they said, so you're saying that? And I said, that's exactly what I'm saying. And I said, but I don't feel any different towards you. I believe you're going to rob yourself if you don't pursue this truth. If you don't, da, 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 da. And I just kept, because you're the one seeking the answers. So be ready to handle your answers when they come. Don't push them aside. So I challenged them. Like if you're asking a question, make sure you're ready for the answer. If you're, a, if you're a child and you ask your parent, can I go here, you better be prepared for a no as much as you want a yes. Or you become a whiner, a beggar, a tantrum person, or mad at your parents because they never let you do what you want to do. Well, you put them in the position. You ask them a question. You better be ready to handle a no if they choose no. That's how you honor your parents. Yeah? See, I, I, I teach kids that. I was in a church and this little seven-year-old said, she's so bright. She'd come up to me and she said, hi. I said, hey, you. And I squeezed her and there's a little story behind it. I don't have time to go into her. I'll be another hour. Because it was a night I preached for three hours and six minutes. It was crazy. And she didn't want me to stop, seven years old. 
And when I saw the time and panicked and said, I need to stop, she stood to her feet and said, no. <laughs> I said, no. Honey, I've been preaching for hours. A guy on the cell phone. I've been recording this. Three hours and six minutes. I, and I, I said, honey, you should be asking your mother if I'm ever going to stop and can't you go home yet? And she said, oh, no, sir. Seven. I get so much out of what you said. Seven. She wasn't thinking, are you ever going to stop three hours? How can I bring for three hours? This is a long service. She was sitting on the edge of her seat, hearing like she never heard, going, wow, I get it. And when I told her I'm stopping, she panicked. No! I said, how old are you? She said, seven. I said, man, you inspire me to just keep on going and preaching. And she did some kind of happy dance thing. And I said, chill out, chill out. I am actually stopping. And she sat down and went. So the next day I come in and she ran up to me and she said, hey. And I said, hey, my little buddy. And I hugged her. I said, you so blessed my heart last night. She said, you know. She said, I really like my children's church. Like nothing against my children. Who would think of that at seven? To qualify that. Nothing against my children's church. I like it a lot. But I don't want to go down there today. She said, I want to sit up and listen to you. I said, you really do, don't you? She said. I said, wow, and I hugged her again, and I said, well, where's mommy and daddy? And Because her mommy got healed that night. It was an amazing thing. And I said, where's mommy and daddy? She said, they're back. Oh, I said, okay, I see mom. I said, that's your daddy? Because he wasn't there the night before. She said, yeah. I said, here's what you do. See, so I'm getting to instruct her on being a, a child, and, and their parents don't even know what I'm doing, but they would have been thankful if they'd have heard me. I, I, said, <laughs> I said, listen, here's what you do. I said, you go ask your parents, okay? And you ask them if you can stay up. And because you wanted to hear my heart and hear what I have to say. But you have to understand this. When you ask your parents a question like that and you're full of desire and you want them to say yes, at the same time you have to honor their no if they so desire that you just stay in children's church for whatever reason. And the, remember how the Bible says, honor mother and father? She went, I said, the highest way you can honor them is you go back there and you want them to say yes. Mommy, Daddy, can I stay up and listen to Dan and skip children's church? And if they say no, I'd rather you go to children's church. Just say, oh, okay. Okay, Mom, okay, Dad, thank you, bless you. And just go to children's church. Don't do the, oh, but I want to stay, but please. I said, because, honey, every time you do that, you just teach yourself self-centeredness, get in your own way. She went, okay. It's phenomenal. So she took off and asked her parents, and I went off my way, and people were talking stuff. I'm up there preaching. I kind of forgot about her, and I never really saw her after that. I'm up there preaching. I look, and she's sitting right there. <laughs> I'm preaching. I'm like, hey. And she's like, <laughs> I thought, well, I guess they said yes. <laughs> I, gave, I gave these girls what I thought in my heart. They cried. And here's what they said to me. Thanks for your insight. Thanks for your encouragement. And thanks for the scripture. We're not sure we're ready, and we're not sure where we stand, but thank you for loving us. And I said, honey, I, yeah, I won't change what I believe, but I'll never stop loving you. And I said, listen, girls, and I told them they're in a very delicate place because they have convictions. And I said, if you follow your convictions, God will give you the grace to break free. God will give you the grace to not be inundated with emotions, feelings, and connective stuff. If you really ask him, I believe he'll help you get free and move on in what he really created you for. And that's what I left him with. You got to be careful you don't come at men. I used the example this morning and never actually finished the story. I see it right now. This denominational pastor, I was doing a service in his church and he hosted it, but he didn't know me. And when I preached, he froze. I saw him as I'm preaching, freeze out in the foyer and listen. And he left his group and came and stood in the doorway and leaned and listened the whole time. So he wanted to spend time with me. He wanted to take me to the airport and everything. He wanted to ride together. When we got alone, he started weeping. And he said, you really messed with me today. He said, I've been to, he was at two seminaries, had two Bible college degrees, pastor stuff. He said, they taught me the whole time in Bible school to come at men based on their depravity. He said, and you come at men based on their value. And I've never even heard of that concept. But when you shared it, it was so powerful, it grabbed my own heart. 
I said, yeah, because when you come at men with their depravity, then they stay condemned and they feel judged and they wonder if they're good enough and did they fail again? And they're constantly crying and saying they're sorry and never feel good enough. You gotta separate them from works and get them over here into grace where their life can be changed and not be afraid you're enabling sin, you're removing sin. You're empowering them to be changed. Most pastors are afraid that if they preach that, they're gonna allow people to do bad and think it's okay. It couldn't be farther from the truth. You can't listen to me preach and go out and not live changed and not think about it. It'll, it'll get you in your sleep. <laughs> like, there's nothing I preach that empowers you to stay the way you were. Yeah. But yet the message is he loves you and it'll never fail and he values you, but it's not based on your performance, it's based on your created purpose. He's redeeming the truth. You get it? So I never attack a man's depravity. I go after their value. Because I read this scripture in Romans that says the goodness of God is what leads men to change. So, yeah, I don't think you can address these hot topics from the public platform. I think they should be, and picket signs aren't our answer. Man, I, I said, I hope if things ever come hard in this country that the church is prepared to do more than pick it. Yeah, come on. Come on. <laughs> and stand for her rights. It's time to walk in love and have an expression of Christ. I see these signs where so-called Christians are holding up, God hates gays, God hates fags. Gays will be judged, repent. I'm like, wow, you're accomplishing a lot. It's not good. It's not good. I couldn't disagree more. I'm saying that probably with a recorder. I'll probably get an email about that. <laughs> couldn't disagree more. Yeah. It doesn't say, for God so hated you, he sent his son hoping you'd believe on him and change. <laughs> it says, God so loved you. He's, his love is bigger than what the love you and I grew up calling love. His love separates what they're doing from what they're created to be. Come on, on your darkest day, look, if you break one law, you've broken all the law. So you say, well, I, I never lived a homosexual lifestyle. Yeah, but you did this, you lied, you cheated, you stole, you did something. You're the same. You get judged as the man that murdered. Because if you break one law, you've broken all laws because you've lived outside of the nature and character of God. And you need a savior, and you need the same blood as the murderer. Yeah. Actually, to hate is to murder. Because you cut off the value and destiny of the one you hate. You can't see past what you hate. In your eyes, you've murdered them. And they have no value beyond what you hate. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. That's what Jesus said. You say... But I say, he who hates his brother has already committed murder. You say, don't commit murder, but I say, if you hate your brother, you've already murdered. Jesus. Wow. So what's he addressing? The heart. Yeah? So, yeah, I'm done with that question. I hope I answered it. I, yeah. I did better. Oh, I'm totally good. I, I, it's up to these guys. I, I'm like, I'm like, I'm eternal. <laughs> I, I'm eternal. I, I'm never going to die and I'm just having fun. I'm just, yeah, yeah. The Energizer Bunny has nothing on what's in me. I've had Energizers in these battery packs and they have died on me and I was still going. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Come on, man. The bunny. He needs more than energizers. Yeah. All right. Um, it's a good question. Your story about God telling you he loves you when you were on the floor at that conference. I believe he loves me, but I've never experienced it like that. How do you hear God like that? Okay. Well, that was just him choosing to manifest that way and speak to me that clear. But here's what you have to understand about me first, okay? I believe he loves me way before I ever experienced his love for me. 
the believing his love is first. That's your strong tower. That's your foundation. That's your rock, believing it. If you need it to be manifested, you'll always question your belief until it's affirmed. And then when it's affirmed through manifestation, you'll think another manifestation is continual affirmation and you'll live for the moment instead of the truth. So I don't need that to believe he loves me. He just came in a special way and was teaching me something about sonship in my view every day, about not being sin conscious and not staying in sin conscious and staying son conscious, right? Believing I'm his and he loves me. So he was just affirming that and teaching me that and he just had fun with it and he really made me cry. And he blew on me. I could tell he was melting me. It, I, it was ridiculous. It was so real that there was no way Excuse me, there was no way I could endure it, stand up, or walk out of it. I tried to get up three times, and he melted me like water into the floor. Three times I decided I'm getting up because I need to preach. Pull it together, Dan. And I barely got up, and he just went, and I was done. There was no thing I could do about it. I didn't ask for that. It was actually amazing. There's manifestations I've had I don't even talk about. Never, ever in my Christian life has mentioned things that have happened to me in the Lord because people go after them. Yeah. And then, then you hear, once you share them, then people start sharing their stories. Of, oh, I had this manifestation. I had that manifestation. Look, right. manifestations are a dime a dozen. Knowing and the truth is what's going to take you through the long run. Manifestation, you can so look for a manifestation and open the door so wide anything can come through anyway. Be careful with manifestations that way. Yeah. You're not seeking a manifestation, you're seeking truth, and truth is in him. So if I believe he loves me, I never need to experience he loves me because my believing develops a knowing that is actually a knowing that ends up being experiential because my heart knows. Wow. Like right now, I'm not feeling the love of God, but man, I know he loves me. Like he loves me. Like, yay. You get it? Somebody just gave me a shirt. It was in my mailbox. I don't even know where it came from. I didn't even have a note attached to it. But I've used the example of sometimes you just got to pull out the big daisy and just pour, pull in the petals. He loves me. He loves me. He loves me. And not be afraid of it. He loves me. He loves me not because there's no he loves me not. And just walk in your bedroom and pull the petals. He loves me. He loves me. And just get flaky with it. You get down to the last two and don't be afraid of where it's fallen because there's no he loves me not. So they just got me a shirt. It has a big daisy on it and a petal falling to the ground. It says, he loves me, he loves me, he loves me. It was what I slept in last night. I used it for my little night shirt in your big king bed with the king. He loves me. I slept last night in a he loves me shirt with a daisy and a petal fall. Couldn't even hardly come out of the room this morning. <laughs> Yay. Why? He loves me. Look, I'm a guy, and I'm talking like this and freaked out. It's good, guys. If you'd see me in my dress, I look really good. <laughs> I got this white dress. It's a robe of righteousness, so it looks good on me. I look good to him anyway, huh? So be free, man. We're not talking about anything weird and natural. It's all spiritual. He, he made us his bride. He loves us. And guys, you can receive that love. Guys, you can all receive that love. Yeah. Get alone. Don't just think it's a girl thing. Oh, Jesus. Guys, you can receive that love. Get alone. Close the door and be with him. Yeah? Yeah. 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 Um, did I answer that question? Yes. Yeah. As a follow-up question, um, do you think it's okay to pursue being taken up to heaven or seeing Jesus? I... I never pursue that stuff. I pursue knowing him. And if he chooses to give me an experience in the process of knowing him, I certainly won't fight that. I'm not big on manifestations, guys. Manifestations have got tons of people in trouble. I've had people call me, and they're offended at sister so-and-so, and yet they say they visit heaven and sit at his feet every day. And I'm like, you're not doing that. You're in delusion. You're not sitting at the feet of Jesus every day and offended at sister so-and-so. You're in delusion. Stop. Stop hiding behind delusion. You're demeaning sitting with Jesus every day when you're living offended. <laughs> so you have the need to say you're having this encounter to be marked as spiritual, but you don't even reveal your spirituality by loving your sister. See, I, it doesn't even matter to me if you tell me 
you were walked by the hand by Michael into the and whatever and da da da. If you can't love your brother, none of that means a thing to me. And it doesn't matter. Don't pursue manifestation. Come on. Heaven's in you. Why do you need to go there? He's in you. That's so good. Don't pursue manifestations, please. Pursue him. You know, people tell me I'm wrong for this, but I, I'm not even worried about being wrong. I, like, like, there was a time in my life where, and this guy, he called everybody up front, and I didn't, we didn't know what to do, if I should even want to go up front, but he kind of put us all on the spot. I went, oh, leaders, I want you guys up there. And he started praying for these manifestations going on our lives. And it was a whole gold dust thing in the hole, whatever. And he said, so I want you to look at your hands right now because God's putting gold dust all over you guys. And I looked down, and my hands were red, blue, and silver. Flex all over my hands. I'm like, what? I don't want red, blue, and silver flex on my hands. And I don't need it on my hands to pray for the sick. It's not encouragement to me. It actually creates questions, and it's weird to me. So I'm like, I don't even know about this, Lord. I don't think I should have come up in this line. I don't need you to cover my body with gold dust to prove the value. You put your son on the cross, I'm valued. I don't need gold dust covering me yeah. to say I'm valuable. But I see a neat story one time, guy in the kingdom school that we did, he's crying, he can't believe his value. We're teaching him, pouring into him. He's just laying, crying. He's talking to the Lord on the floor and he can't get past the verse that we're all in the school doing and he just can't. And he's just crying, God help me, I'm unbelievable. I just don't know, I just don't know why I have this stronghold. And when he got up from the floor, he had this perfectly cut stone laying right under his face. In the carpet. He picked it up and he went, what? This can't be God. He came to me and said, is, did God do this? I said, I don't know. It might have fell out of somebody's earring. I said, why don't you go get it checked and see what it is? He went and got it checked, and the guy said, where did you get this? He said, well, I was praying at the church in the carpet, and I didn't know if it fell out of somebody's ring or earring. He said, sir, I can't even tell what substance this is. This is unidentifiable substance. I don't even know. It's not showing us anything that we're aware of. And besides, who would have cut this? It's so flawless, no one could cut a stone like this stone's cut. And he began to tremble and realized the Lord said, I value you. And he gave him a stone with a substance that's undetectable and a cut that nobody could do. So he had to put in a little post and put it in his ear just to remind him. God did that for me on that day when I was crying out and really seeking. Now that, now watch, when you share that story, you know what people do? They start praying for a stone. <laughs> no, you pray for a revelation. Yeah. You pray for your heart to open up. So a week after this thing at the altar, I'm in a restaurant, and I walk by this couple, and I stopped right at their booth. They were sitting talking, and I said, hey, guys, I'm sorry. I don't mean to be intrusive and invasive. I know you're probably waiting for your meal. Yeah, what's up? Man, I just heard something for you, ma'am. You heard something? What do you mean? Honestly, I know it's right. It's the Lord. He lives in me. Bam, bam, bam. <laughs> she grabs her husband's arm. He's squeezing her tight. He said, dude, this is freaky. I said, no, no, it's the Lord. <laughs> well, it's dead on. That's freaky. I said, no, it's the Lord. We're going to pray, and he's going to change this. And I, and I went to pray, and I looked down, and I got my whole hands are red, blue, and silver. And I'm like, to me, it's a distraction. I turned, and I said, Lord, I don't even know what this is. If it's you, I know you're too big to get offended. I don't get it. I don't need it to have faith to believe you're rocking her. You already gave me a word of knowledge. You're already moving. I don't want this on my hands. I don't want it in my life. I looked down. It was all gone. It's never come back. I don't need it. I don't want it. Well, you shouldn't pray a manifestation away. I don't want it. Why do I need red, blue, and silver flecks on my hand to have faith to pray for a lady? Why is that? People say, well, it's just a sign. It points to Jesus. How does it point to him? How does the manifestation point to him? Nobody's ever answered these questions for me, but teachers teach this stuff. Well, it's just a sign. How's it point to him? 
The word of knowledge points to him. The manifestation of healing points to him. But leave my hands alone. Keep that stuff off of me. <laughs> See, I'm adamant about it. And I'm not ashamed to talk about it. And God's not offended with me. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Does that mean every manifestation is not God? No. When you need them, I'm concerned. They're a dime a dozen. When they show up in the middle of your pursuit for him, that's different. When you're pursuing knowing him, pursuing being changed by him, and he encounters you, I'm praying for five weeks in my bed, room for God and to establish me in love and playing a little CD. I'm not even coming out of the bedroom but to go to work and come back because I don't have a relationship with my wife. I've got my kids though and I'm loving on them as best I can. And, but, but I'm in the bedroom all the time and then five weeks in, this, this literal whirlwind. See, I don't even share this stuff normally. This whirlwind, I'm just trying to give you an example practical of how it happens and you're not looking for it. I'm just enjoying being with him. And this whirlwind comes into my room. It's so overwhelming that I curl up in the middle of the bed and I'm trembling and it feels like I'm Dorothy on the Wizard of Oz. I mean, you're thinking the cow's coming by in a minute and the lady on the bike, you know. <laughs> but you're so overwhelmed, you're not even looking up, actually. And you're just curled up in a fetal position and you're shaking and it's so real to you in that moment and amazing. And the Lord, with a voice that I heard, said, do you even realize I've given you the privilege of loving in my unfailing love? What he was saying is, stop seeking my heart. It's in you. And he was letting me know we're one. And don't pray from where you think you're not. Pray from what you've become. Oh. And the whirlwind subsided, and I sat up, and I'm so freaked out. Like, you think you're ready for that stuff. Some of you are praying for it, and you're not even close to ready. It freaks you out. You're sitting there, and you're... <sighs> But you know he's in you and his love is. <sighs> and you stop praying the way you were praying and you start praying from a thank you. Wow, I thank you, your heart's in me. I thank you when I look through my eyes, I see what you behold. Wow, I thank you, we're one. It changed my whole prayer life. Come on. But I wasn't seeking the encounter. God saw my sincerity and my seeking and said, I'll tell you what, I'll just give him a little encounter. It'll get the message across and he'll get it. And he did it. Don't seek that, seek him. When the manifestation happens in the pursuit of him, it'll always be healthy. Yeah. If the manifestation happens because you're seeking the manifestation, I would question that it'll be healthy and you might need another manifestation and another one and you might go to this service because this happens and you want to encounter and, this, and go to this and you need him to lay hands so you can feel it. And next thing you know, you're just running all around and Jesus is in you the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> you guys okay? You're kind of looking, some of you are looking at me funny. You all right? I'll tell you when you were looking at me funny when I said I don't want that stuff on my hands. I saw some folks looking at me. And I'm telling you, I don't need that stuff on my hands. Faith comes by hearing and by the word. Faith doesn't come because I have speckles on my hands. Faith comes because Jesus rose from the dead and sits triumphant at the right hand of Almighty God and His blood's speaking better things and God's love never fails. That's where faith comes from. Yeah? There was a time in my life I got so tangible praying for the sick, my face would go numb, I would vibrate, my ribs, it was unbelievable, my whole leg would just vibrate and feel like it was half asleep. And it would be like, feel like my hands were in a paint shaker, but they weren't shaking. But to me, it was like they were violently shaking to where it almost hurt. And yet you couldn't see them shake. And what it did, it started to get me to depend on the manifestation. So I would pray for that. I would try to work myself up and step into that. And I would, was taught that's the anointing coming on you to empower you to pray. And, 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 and then I got into this thing where manifestations seemed so important. And, and then if it wasn't happening, I didn't have faith to actually pray until my hands were vibrating. And the Lord talked to me about it. And he said, Dan, when I did that to you, it was a sign of grace to get you to step into something you've never done before. It's just like a child learning to walk and the daddy pats it on the behind and says, it's okay, you can do it. That's all that is. It's a, you can do this because I'm with you. He said, stop leaning on the manifestation. It's the truth that makes men free, not your hands vibrating. Come on. That's so good. 
But I kept leaning on the manifestation because it was just so easy. And when it wasn't there, I didn't have the same confidence. And one day, it was completely gone. And I said, and honestly, when it was in that season, I wasn't seeing as many manifestations of healings, miracles. I wasn't seeing the cancers disappear like I was believing for. And then one day, I didn't have the manifestation. I saw people still experienced him. Sometimes they tangibly got touched. Sometimes they fell out, whatever. Sometimes we think this stuff is also important. What's important is that the cancer goes away. What's important is that the life is transformed. Yeah. Look, I, I'm not interested in you laying on the floor screaming for an hour saying you're on fire, getting up and you still have the infection. Yeah. It diminishes something about God's presence. It's something's wrong. I, I'm not into all that. It's too weird to me. I'd rather, I tell people, stand up. Yeah. Like, oh, I say, it's okay, stand up. We've been down enough. Stand up. And I'll pray. Because I want to see the fruit of what we're believing for. I could care less if you're scratching fleas. <laughs> yeah? You know what I mean, right? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I've seen amazing things. I've seen God do some stuff. It's, that's not what we're going for. He said, I said, Lord, why don't I feel you anymore when I pray? He said, Dan, you've been caught living by feelings. I've removed it from you so you minister unlimited. Because when the feelings are there, you believe I'm there. And when they're not, you think I need to show up. And I'm in you. And I cried in my car and said, thank you. What a gift. I was in a service, I was so, it was distracting me. It was so ridiculous. I remember getting near a lady and I was three feet away and she melted like, and I got four feet from the next one and they melted and I'm like, oh my goodness, go. Oh. And I turned, I was very young, Lord. I turned, I said, Lord, this is so amazing. But it hurts, it's like almost distracting me. I believe you're here and I really don't need it like this right now, thanks. I know you're here. It just went, whoop, going, whoop, just going. I turned, I still have one more person to pray for, and isn't it amazing how as soon as it was gone, I walked near him, and I wasn't sure God was going to touch him. And I just told God that I know you're here, I don't need this, and when it went, thump, I felt alone. And I thought, wow, this thing is powerful, this feeling, this emotion, this sensual thing that we've grown up in, it's very dangerous sometimes to pursue that. Yeah. Just pursue him. Yeah? Yeah? Mm. Okay. okay. One, one more. I'm good. All right. Are they good? You guys okay? Okay. It's on healing. Oh, it's going to be a long answer, buddy. <laughs> I'm just ready to draw my sword. <laughs> Yeah, I like that phrase. Do you hit it again? That's how we talk at home. We're like, hit it again. Yeah. Hit it again. Um, hit it again. Or, no, yeah, okay. I'm going to start over. This is a great healing, question. This isn't as scary as I thought. Yeah, when declaring healing over, over someone, if it doesn't manifest right away, do you hit it again in prayer, or do you just stand in faith? That's a tremendous question. There's no direct answer on that you have to learn to perceive the moment if you who's ever prayed for the sick and you realized after you prayed a couple of times you were actually striving and you were more in unbelief because of what you weren't seeing than what you originally set out believing yeah. who's experienced that so you need to discern that for one thing and you need to really discern the position of the person because you really you want them blessed you want that heal if you're just looking for the testimony and the healing for the sake of healing you're way backwards anyway you want them touched by the finished work so that God reveals himself through healing in their lives and they walk free from whatever it is, right? It's not about a testimony. It's not about, whoa, I prayed and they were healed. Even though that's exciting. It's amazing that God would heal somebody through us, that we would say, be healed in Jesus' name, and even something like incur incurable, according to medical science, would disappear. That's a wow, right? Yeah. Here's, here's, there's, there's no right or wrong in this. Here's how I teach it out. When I pray for somebody and nothing changes, I talk to them about that first of all and make sure I keep my own heart guarded because my heart used to get 
troubled by that and frustrated, and it would make me like, I remember Todd now, and Todd was very young in the Lord. He's like a bulldog anyway. So we got that. We'd say, hit it again. That's why I'm laughing at the hit it again. Because yeah. we'd say, he'd say, dude, we just got to hit it again. <laughs> I'm like, okay, we can hit it again. So, Father, I just thank you. How's it feel? It's the same. That's Todd, you know, he's like, hit it again. <laughs> If the person you're praying for, especially if it's in a church over something, you can talk and ask and find out that they're totally fine, but you, it's never works and it's not, you have to be careful that you don't turn faith into this. Got a tumor sticking up right here. <laughs> Father, I just thank you that whatever I ask in Jesus' name, it shall be done in Jesus' name. Tumor, you leave. Whatever I ask in Jesus' name shall be done. Jesus' name. Father, I just thank you right now that and after about four prayers, and Lord, I don't know what I'm missing, but I... <laughs> there has to be a place where you wrap faith around what you believe and never let faith turn into a point in time. Faith is the position of your heart to believe what he accomplished. So you're not threatened by believing. You're actually threatened by not believing. But when you believe and you pray over a visual thing like that and you don't see it change, you have to make sure not seeing it change doesn't change you. So when you take your hand off and it's still sitting there and it looks like it has a face and it's looking back at you. <laughs> yeah? You look and you don't look too deep, right? And you just say, Father, I just thank you for what you're doing. You're so good. I thank you that your desire is wholeness in my life or in their life. And God, whatever I ask, we pray pray believing it shall be done and if I lay hands on the sick it'll recover it gives I have these scriptures that give me a precedence for this right so they stir faith in my heart and I go thank you for what you're doing God and you teach people to never turn faith into a hit miss win or lose maybe he will maybe he won't let's give it a try that is not faith faith is he loves you he heals he restores let's believe him so watch you go home from being prayed for and they only prayed one time, and you said, hey, I'm good, I'm believing. Or they prayed four times, and the whole time they prayed, they were like, are you good? Are you, do you understand we're just believing for a manifestation right now? Listen, one way or the other, we're believing change is coming to your hip, and we're believing he loves you and he paid a price, and right now we're not striving, trying to make this happen. We're just speaking over it. Sometimes I feel like we need to swing the sledge of faith and just crush the rock that's trying to sit in front of us. And can we just pray one, two, three more times? Are you good with that? And we'll just pray. And what you do is, what will give you a way that you're grabbing for straws is if you're changing your prayer every time. I've been in this thing for a little bit. I've learned some stuff. Watch this. I've seen people say, well, let me try. I've seen people shift their whole prayer the second time because they're thinking, well, the first time didn't connect. Let's try this way. Third time, whole different prayer. Watch. Be healed in Jesus' name is probably plenty if there's a revelation because faith says to the mountain. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So if the thing doesn't change, does that shake you to where you don't believe anymore because you need the immediate result because Jesus has all these suddenlies in his life? Or do you thank God that if I lay hands on the sick, they'll recover, and I'm so blessed that I got to speak this into your life, and over this, this thing is changing, and I'm not talking in months. This thing is changing, bless God. You've got to believe that. I've seen countless people not see any change, but teach them to not change. You know how people get healed in a healing service, and then somebody's over here prayed for and nothing changed? We don't address it enough. They leave the service. You know what they're thinking? I wonder why they got healed and I didn't. I wonder what I'm doing wrong. I wonder what's blocking my healing. I think I need inner healing. I need some kind of ministry. There's got to be something blocking my healing. Yeah. Right? And then they go home and they're actually more downcast than encouraged. And the fact that they didn't get healed in the healing service is a bummer. And we go to bed, they go to bed bummed instead of in him. So I teach that you never take that personal. You never mark yourself as not healed. You mark yourself as loved and God doing a work in you. So you crawl in bed and your hip grabs you ooh, like it does every night. Even though you were prayed for and saw four other people testify they were healed. And two of them in their hips, right? And you're like, Ugh. you throw that away. Don't think on it. You get home, you crawl in bed, your hip grabs you. Here's how your hip changes. You roll over and you say, Father, I so thank you for what you're doing in my body through what you did in your son. 
God, I thank you that you are restoring me joint upon joint, bone upon bone, muscle upon muscle. God, you are doing such a good work in me. Thanks for loving me. And you smile, sincere, faith-filled, and you fall asleep in that place. You wake up in that place. That's how your hip changes. When you think with your mind, look with your eyes, think with your mind, that's a troubled day. When you spiritually analogy it, troubled day. So there's no right or wrong in the question. I weigh my own life, and I weigh the person I'm praying for. If I pass somebody in the street, I've done this countless times. Hey, you on the way, you going to lunch from work or something? Yeah, yeah, I don't have much time. Why, what's up, do I know you? No, 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 listen. Man, I felt this in my heart. Whoa, how'd you know that? Listen, it's, it's the Lord, honestly. I won't be long. Listen, nobody will even know what we're doing, man. I know you're trying to get to lunch. About six seconds, I'm just going to pray. I believe God's taking that out of you. Bam, pray. No matter what he says, I discern that he's heading to work. I, whether he says it's gone or it's not, I'm already positioned, man. He's given me one shot to step into his personal life and his little circle. And he's given me that one chance. That's all I need. I'm blessed to get hands on him and pray, right? So if he tells me the pain's still there or the pain's gone or the pain's somewhat gone, decides how I'm going to respond. If he says it's still there, usually if he's on his way to lunch and I can tell he's already in a hurry, I'm not here to belabor him. I'm here to bless him. So I say, well, listen, man, I'm so honored you let me pray for you. I won't say can I pray again most times if I discern I'm holding him up. If I think he has a lot of time, I'll flat out ask him, hey, man, do you have time? What do you mean? Listen, I just want one more time. I just want to pray one more time. I just want to see one more time. I just want to see. I feel like if we could pray one more time, something might shift and change. You say, aren't you taking a risk? No. If I pray one more time and nothing changes, I still have the same faith and the same truth to wrap around that. I say, listen, man, I'm so honored you gave me the chance to pray for you these couple times. Here's what the Bible says. I'm so excited about it. It's why I stopped you. If I lay hands on the sick, believing they shall recover. The reason I stopped you is because I'm believing. God's going to do a work in you. When that pain disappears, you get out of your car tonight, you're laying in your bed, you wake up for work, and you realize, oh my goodness, it's gone. You know where your heart's going to go? Right to him. Because this was God. He's doing a work, and I'm excited. Thanks for your time, man. Bless you. You walk away, and people realize you ain't selling nothing. You didn't invite them to church. You didn't pass an offering basket, and you didn't hand a business card. And they're going, whoa, that dude's sincere, and it's almost like he cared for me. And all of a sudden, God can work into their heart that he cared for them from the beginning. And next thing you know, they're laying on their bed crying, having an encounter with God, because you sow deceit. And instead of sitting there going, I wonder why their pain didn't go away, and I'm not walking in any anointing, and they didn't get healed. No, 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 no. If love never fails, don't fail to love. Step out and pray. If they're in a hurry, I don't ask to pray again. If they change somewhat, you usually have the grace to say, so that's definitely better. Oh my gosh, that's, that's like 60, 70% better. They're excited, it's their body, they're not making that up, they're telling you. 60, so if they say that, they're usually excited. And if you say, can we just pray one more time? I believe God will, will take that even further. I really don't remember anybody saying no. Yeah. They'll be like, yeah, because they're intrigued. Yeah. And if they're healed, that's a no brainer. Yeah. They're like, what the blank? A lot of times. <laughs> and isn't it amazing? I've never seen the sickness jump back on them when they swear. <laughs> what the blank? Oh! <laughs> I've never seen that. Why? Because God's not startled by them swearing. He already knew it before he healed them. He's not grabbing Jesus' ears at the right hand. the blank ah! <laughs> he's not a legalist he loves people yeah. he paid a price to forgive the sins of the world and his mercy triumphs over judgment men don't have to get what they deserve Come on. so yeah you can pray 10 12 times if the if the grace is there if you're not striving and the person you're praying for is totally cool with you contending pray as long as you can without striving when you feel like you're frustrated, you're trying to get something to happen, or you're changing up your prayer, or getting a different tone on the shofar, or looking for another colored flag, that's when it's probably time to pack up and, and wrap faith around truth, okay? Todd and I personally prayed for an 
80-year-old lady who had arthritis so bad that her hands were all going in the same direction and she couldn't even pick up silverware. It was rheumatic arthritis and her hands were so manipulated she couldn't pick up a spoon or anything. And we saw her hands and we just cried. Todd's like, oh, dude. And I'm like, it's okay, we're going to pray. We prayed for her. I'm thinking we prayed for her. Don't quote me on this, but in the ballpark of 15, 12, 14, 15 times. And, and we just kept praying, and we're like, honey, is, is, is anything changed? Well, no. <laughs> Feel the same. Do you mind if we just pray again to you? You boys are really go-getters, huh? <laughs> You're right. I know, she was the sweetest lady, and we're like, you have no idea. Like, this guy is a pit bull in disguise. He's a pit bull in a human body. He's like, he's not really a man. He's like, <laughs> so we're praying, and we watch. Her hands, watched. Her hands go straight. But we don't pray 15 times for everybody. We don't write a book on that. Yeah. We don't turn something that was in the moment in Holy Spirit into a method of ministry. Yeah. 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 I saw a spirit come out of a lady one time singing a song over her. Because it happened to be her favorite spiritual song that made her feel so close to God and got the attention of her heart. And she was in infidelity and in unconfessed sin and she was bound by the spirit for so long. And, and when I sang this song over her, it activated her heart toward God. And when her heart went, God, I'm sorry, the thing left her immediately because it had no way to stay. But I have never sang a song over a person since. And I didn't write a book on songs of deliverance. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. We don't understand that Holy Spirit is amazing and he inspires. And sometimes yeah. we take what he does and try to turn it into a method of ministry. Yeah. And then we lose the sharp edge that it has when it's by him. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Todd and I were in a mall, public setting, lady smoking a cigarette over by a, a thing there. And she said, there's sand in it. And she's standing there. She's rough language. And we just love her, man. We're like, oh my goodness, this lady. Like we just imagined her upbringing. Where well, she's not repulsive to us. We're not thinking, oh my gosh, this lady needs to clean up. Are you kidding? She needs love. She needs Jesus. She needs a revelation. We went over and realized she couldn't bend her leg at all, that she was in a terrible accident and her leg was frozen for years and years. And her friend's sitting beside her. And we said, honey, what happened to your leg? Oh my goodness. And can you even bend it? She said, oh, oh, blank, no, I can't move that blank and leg. That leg's been blank and frozen for, I mean, I'm not exaggerating. That's her. She was, you know, talking to us. She's just smoking. It's just funny. We said, listen, would you let us pray for your leg? What? What the blank? You want to pray for my leg? We do. We honestly believe God can change your leg. We, we, would you let us just pray and let's see? You got nothing to lose. Come on. If it doesn't change, it was that way already anyway. Yeah. And you weren't expecting it to change, so you're certainly not let down. You're kind of thinking we're probably cuckoo. Why don't you let us pray? You got nothing to lose. Well, you can if you want. We looked at each other. <laughs> it was me and Todd. We knelt down. We started to pray. Every time we prayed, it was so funny. She'd sit her cigarette down. <laughs> sit it down. See, people have a sense. Yeah. She'd set it down and stand there. Soon as we'd stop, she'd pick it right up. <laughs> Soon as we'd pray, she'd put it down. It was hilarious. We prayed for her about eight times. She's laughing at us like, you think my leg's just going to change? I mean, it's been frozen since 1970, whatever. And I'm like, honey, it don't matter. He's God. He breathed into a dirt. A man stood up, girl. He raised Lazarus from the dead. He can fix your leg. Hmm. We're going to pray again if you don't mind. No, she was amused by it. I think she appreciated our conversation. She appreciated that we actually had a sincere sense of caring. She didn't agree with us. She probably thought we were a little loco spiritually. But she was, I think, in, entertained by us. And she's like, go ahead. You can pray all day if you want. We're like, yes! Because <laughs> we weren't striving. We're believing. Yeah. It was probably about the eighth time. And she said, whoa, something feels different. Todd's like, what? What's different? 
And he's looking at me. I said, it's okay, buddy. <laughs> down, boy, down. <laughs> and, 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 and she said, I don't know. It just something happened when you prayed. It's almost like I felt something through my leg. I said, honey, would you bend your leg? She said, I can't bend my leg. Would you try? We watched her kneel in the mall on a leg that was completely frozen. And I had to repent in my heart because when she was kneeling, I, I said in my heart, I did. I said, Lord, that's a good position for her. <laughs> Keep her there for a while. <laughs> kneeling is not going to hurt this lady one bit. <laughs> But here's what happened. She stood up and she started crying hard. Her neighbor knew her all these 20 years and knew that she'd never bent her leg. Witnessed the whole thing. Tell me that's not vital seed. You say, well, did you lead her to the Lord? We gave her the Lord. Amen. Now she has to deal with it. And if she'd say, what must I do to be saved? That's an easy answer. I don't try to push people into a confession. I minister Jesus to them till their heart says, how can I know him like you? I've had people on airplanes cry and look me in the eyes and say, how can I know him like you? I see you know him. I want to know him like you. To me, that's them saying, what must I do to be saved? Yeah? Yeah? I'm not trying to get a confession, a notch in the belt, a fish on the board. I want them to encounter him to where he transforms their life. So she got rocked and her neighbor got rocked. We prayed probably eight times. She was totally cool with it. We didn't feel like we were striving, game on. I've been in situations where I got emotionally involved, where it was a child, where it was something really intense. And I could tell myself I was getting caught up emotionally and I was striving and I was frustrated and I had to back out and find faith and leave them in a place of faith because I knew I was banging my head against the wall. I was across the line, if you hear me. That's happened to me more than once, especially with children. And how do you uh, in that moment, when you say, I need to take a step back? Yeah, and great question. Say, like okay, that? it looks like this. I, tell the, I haven't told the testimony for a long time, but it's one from a long, long, long time ago, but it's when I first learned this, so it's precious to me. So to me, it's a highlight clip for my life. It's a marker. I'm praying for a little child that they think could be mentally handicapped for the rest of their life because of a violent seizure nine months old. So you want to hold that baby. You want the possibility of God to come and pray. You're not afraid to hold that baby. You're doing public healing services. You're teaching about the Lord and healing. So you want to hold that baby and pray. The baby has visuals, they're seizures, they're, the baby's shaking like this, and you can tell it's not there. As it's shaking like this, the eyes are going like this. It was very distractive, it was very painful to see. Nine month old baby had no idea what it was doing. It was affected by the seizure neurologically. So you take the baby and you pray your best believing prayer that you understand and believe, and it's not long, but you believe it and you pray it and now you got the baby and you look and what's the first thing you see? This is real. She comes to church because she's overwhelmed. She's bringing the baby. She's over her head. We're proclaiming Christ. She's thinking, let's bring the baby. Maybe Jesus will show up through these people, through the service, through this man, whatever. So I'm in this amazing position to minister Jesus to the baby. So I'm holding the baby. I'm not condemned by this. It's a sobering, humbling, amazing thing. But at some point, this baby isn't changing. At some point, I've got to do what? I've got to either hold the baby till it changes, or at some point, decide it's time to hand the baby back to the lady. Hardest thing you've ever done when you get deceived, when your heart's not in faith is you're sure you lost. You feel like you're not getting anything. And the hardest thing on the planet is being sincere and seeing things like this in your life. And all of a sudden, this baby's not changing. And I have to 
hand it back to the arms of the lady. This is real. And as soon as the baby is being handed back, her eyes fill with tears. Why? Because she's saying, oh, well, I might as well resolve the fact that I brought the baby in hope. It just didn't happen. But, oh, well, but I was hoping, but, oh, well, tears. Now your eyes fill with tears. Because you know that you know, you believe that you know that you know, that deep down in your heart you know that he's God. And he could just go, and then you don't go, well then how come, then why, then what? She's leaving. I'm standing there holding the back of a chair in the front aisle. I remember kicking my toe hard on the carpet because I was full of emotion. I got 10 more people to pray for and I just want to go in a corner and cry. Why? Because when she don't stop shaking, I'm believing she ain't healed and we didn't get it. And when that lady goes out that door, I'm believing we lost. And I'm frustrated, I'm hurt, I'm upset, I want to cry. Holy Spirit, because I'm sincere, I believe, and I ask him to father me all the time. That's one of the reasons I believe he intervenes and, <laughs> and keeps me from making bad mistakes every once in a while. Because I ask him to father me all the time. He said, hey, don't be so deceived. I said, huh? He said, why aren't you counting it a privilege? an honor and a privilege that you touched that baby in Jesus' name. Dan, you're looking with your eyes and thinking with your mind, why are you so deceived? He's saying, why did you change what you believe because you didn't see her change? And I'm going, duh, I preach this stuff. I preach this stuff. But I got so emotional and caught up with the nine months, the visual, the seizure. Oh, it wrenched me that I was deceived. And the Holy Spirit said, why are you so deceived? He said, count it a privilege you touched the baby in Jesus' name. Well, that's amazing. Wow, that counted a privilege. That means you're moving. Heaven's engaged. We release the kingdom. Duh, what am I doing? Watch, don't get offended when I do this. The lady's overwhelmed. She brought her to us hoping she would receive from Jesus through us. I preach the word, represent the word, pray for the baby. But when I look with my eyes and think with my mind, this is what I do with the word. And say, well, we didn't get it. Maybe next time, oh well, didn't work. Now, don't be mad that I threw my Bible over there, okay? Don't anybody get religious on me in this room. God's not bruised. He's not limping. He doesn't have a headache, I promise. And I didn't dishonor him. I'm just using that as an illustration. We tossed the word away. So Holy Spirit said, so I got immediately restored back to me. I went, duh. Yeah. Oh my goodness, we touched the baby. Jesus' name. So I had two ladies working with me because I was starting to try to train and equip, multiply, get people involved. I had two ladies, precious ladies, that just love Jesus. You mentioned his name. Oh, Jesus. They're holding the baby praying and they're feeling just like me. But at some point we gave the baby back to mom. Well, it was actually a neighbor. It wasn't even the mom. The mom had no faith to come anyway, and the neighbor said, can I please take the baby? That was Wednesday night, Friday morning, late towards noon. I got a phone call. It's the lady. Because I got the girls together. I said, listen, I was feeling like, and, I was, and they're like, I said, no, no, listen. Holy Spirit asked why I'm so deceived. Why ain't I counting an honor and privilege to touch the baby in Jesus' name? We held the baby in Jesus' name. We released the kingdom. Lay hands on the sick. They recovered. Duh. We got caught up in the moment. Sentimental. We got caught up in the moment. Little baby. Yeah. Yeah. I said, listen, God is on this thing. He's moving. He can change that baby. Come on. We released the kingdom. We got to believe that. And it was like a football huddle and a new play. And we're going to score. Rah! We couldn't wait to line up on the ball. We go to bed. Live all Thursday, go to bed, Friday late morning. I get a phone call, it's the lady. Dan, I have something amazing to share with you. The mother walked by the crib and the baby was cooing and making baby noises, hasn't made a sound since the seizure. 
She walked in the room and she's holding one of her crib toys, cooing and talking to it with awareness. <laughs> she scooped her up and ran her to John Hopkins. They ran every test, totally negative, every test, and totally normal. The last time I talked to the lady and was aware of the child, it, the baby was in fourth grade. I'm not in touch now, but in fourth grade with no effects of that season, completely a normal fourth grade child. When they walked out of the church, she was the same. Holy Spirit said, why are you so deceived? Why are you looking with your eyes and thinking with your mind? Counting in honor and privilege, you touched the baby in Jesus' name. That's a pretty amazing testimony. Marked my heart and taught me what faith is. Seeing isn't believing. Seeing is believing. Did you get it? When Jesus' disciples couldn't heal the epileptic boy and he called him a perverse generation, a twisted-minded, corrupted thinking people said, bring the boy to me. How long shall I bear with you? How long shall I be with you? He's not mad. He's saying, look, guys, I'm telling you, I'm about to go, be turned over to Pilate and be crucified. I'm going to sit at the right hand of the Father. I'm about to hand you the baton of the New Covenant, New Testament church. You've got to get this. Yeah. Bring the boy to me. Your minds are spinning. You're corrupted in your thinking. Violent seizure, visual. You pray, he doesn't change. Why isn't he changing? Why isn't he healed yet? If Jesus was here, he'd be healed by now. Wonder what we're doing wrong. He instantly heals the boy. They come privately in verse 19. Teacher, why couldn't we heal the boy? Pretty direct question in a question and answer session. Jesus doesn't give the long answers that I give. He says, because of your unbelief. He didn't say, because you ain't got no faith. He said, because of your unbelief. Guess what it translates to be? Guess what it means? Because of what you fail to see. Then he turns around and says, but truly I tell you this, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you'll say to the mountain, move and it'll move, and nothing shall be impossible for you. What's he saying? It's because of what you fail to see, but truly I tell you this, if you see what I see, you'll do what I do, and nothing will be impossible for you. Now, you show me a limitation to what Jesus said, except that we fail to believe it and grow up into it even when we don't see the fruit. It's the only limitation, is that we throw away what he said and try to reevaluate what he said compared to the lack of fruit or somebody dies or doesn't get healed. So why don't we continue in the knowledge of the Son of God and grow up into him in all things to the full measure of the stature of Christ instead of spiritually analogizing a way to make our troubled hearts feel comforted in a false way. Let's just go after this thing. Because I question... See, I threw my Bible over there, remember? I question what would have happened to that little girl. This isn't condemnation, it's sober. If I wouldn't have heard Holy Spirit say, why are you so deceived? I wonder if I'd have never heard the voice of Holy Spirit and just left my Bible thrown and just believed, oh well, we failed and didn't get the answer and oh well, God didn't heal her. I wonder what her state would be. Because here's what we say, well, God will heal her if he wants. And I think we forget that he moves through people, that he gave the earth to the children of men, and he set it up that way for his kingdom to flow through his children. Don't say if God wanted you to have it, he'd give it to you. He says you have not because you ask not. So if you don't speak life, you don't get life. If you speak death, you get death. But God's will in life. Let's not mix this thing up and twist up sovereignty. Let's take the privilege of stewarding the earth and let's walk in truth and live by the Spirit and not fight over it. If men are reaping what they're sowing, then not everything that's happening is orchestrated by the Lord. If we're destroyed by the lack of knowledge, then it has nothing to do with the choice of God. So if you get the knowledge, we can stop destruction. Yeah? yeah. Okay, I'm done. You want to close in prayer? I can. I can. 
Yeah, I wouldn't mind. You guys good? Did you endure this? Is this was yeah. this long? This was long, wasn't it? No, it's just good, man. I hope you all got something out of it. Yeah, <laughs> stop that. <laughs> At least it wasn't a spitball, my brother. <laughs> Were you here this morning? Spitball? Woo! That one was easy. <laughs> spitball would take some faith, wouldn't it? You guys good? Did you get something out of this session? I mean, you feel empowered? Good, I feel empowered. I just appreciate you guys. I thank you for being here, and thank you for your intense hunger. You guys are amazing. You guys are fun to, like, be around and really sit in front of and perceive. You guys are really in a good place with that corporately. I can't say enough about that. Just realize we're a part of something that God's doing, amen, that he created us for. Whether you go to this church or not, we can all wake up for the same reason, live for the same goal. If we're not waking up and pursuing his image and pursuing to walk in love, you're going to miss why you're actually here and life's going to feel like a grind and you're going to get tricked into feeling sorry for yourself or being discouraged, dismayed, or angry. And none of those things produce any life so they can't be the Lord. What a perversion of why you're here. Don't spend another moment in those things because they're not who you are. How's that for straight talk? Yeah? Yeah. So, Father, we just thank you right now for what you're doing. I thank you for the corporate hunger that I perceive every service. I just thank you. You're doing something amazing. And there is people from all around. They're not all just Grove community. But I, I thank you that what you're doing in Grove community, you're doing in other places. What you're doing in other places, you're doing here. And I just believe you have a plan. You have a strategy. And I believe we're honored to be a part of that. And we're asking you to continue to give us wisdom, to empower us, teach us your love, and teach us to walk in and manifest your love without striving, without pressure, without evangelistic duty. Just let the grace of God be so prevalent in our life. Your grace, Lord God, through Jesus Christ, mold us and shape us into something authentic, something real, something that has expression and brings impact. God, we want our lives to make a difference. If you made a difference in me, then I want that difference to make a difference in others. Yeah. And we're asking that corporately today, that our lives would be so touched by you that others couldn't help but be touched by your grace, your power, your love, your attitude, your perspective that all flows through us. God, we thank you. We're honored to be called the embodiment of Christ. Yeah. Let it be such yeah. in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Bless you guys. Thank you so much.